epistle, the epistle for the third Sunday after the Epiphany is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. Brethren, be not wise in your own conceits. To no man render evil for evil, but provide good things not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as far as in you lies, be at peace with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if thy enemy is hungry, give him food. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by so doing, thou wilt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. At that time when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came up and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And stretching forth his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I will be thou made clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See thou tell no one, but go show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a witness to them. Now when he had entered Capernaum, there came to him a centurion who entreated him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying sick at the house, paralyzed, and is grievously afflicted. And Jesus said to him, I will come and cure him. But in answer the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man subject to authority, and have soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled, and said to those who were following him, Amen, I say to you, I have not found such great faith in Israel. And I tell you that many will come from the east and from the west, and will feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be put forth into the darkness outside. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done to thee. And the servant was healed in that hour. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The last two years have been very much about the sense of touch, isn't it? Masks, remote learning, remote working, preventing touch. Any humorous thing, flying to Adelaide last week on Qantas, there are pains the crew people to remind us to keep a safe distance in the plane, which is odd, like telling sardines in a tin to keep a safe distance, or fish in the, <laughs> the ocean not to get wet or something. But these last two years have been about preventing touch. Today's Mass is very much about the sense of touch and a divine way, a divine way of looking at it. Even the collect, which Father uh, just sung before, before the, the Gloria mentions, asking God to stretch forth his right hand but it's today's gospel in which this touch is very prominent. Healing of the leper and the centurion's servant. Now from a Jewish perspective, both the leper and the centurion were in slightly different ways, but very similar, untouchable. Our question for today then is, how does our Lord respond to untouchables? And what can we learn from him? But we need a bit of background first, which you might not know about the Romans and lepers. So firstly, lepers. Uh, it's, leprosy is now known as Hansen's disease, and it precisely takes away one's sense of touch, and more precisely, of pain. And as a result, any wounds that you have, if you're afflicted with it, or sprains, or broken bones, or anything like that, they go unattended, largely unattended, because you can't feel them. I remember once reading an account of a surgeon working in the mid-20th century amongst lepers somewhere and he had just done this microsurgery on this man's damaged fingers and overnight it was all undone because his patient who couldn't feel anything had his fingers, those newly attached fingers, eaten off by a rodent. Makes our melodies seem quite nothing. And as an aside, leprosy is quite an apt illustration of mortal sin regular mortal sin, because both are a sort of living death in different ways. 
that the corruption of the one is manifest, the leper. The corruption of the other, the deeper corruption, is, is hidden. You can't see it. And just as leprosy numbs and blunts the senses to pain, so the soul, which is burdened down with mortal sins, especially sins of the flesh, become quite desensitized to their own painful guilt, to actual grace, and to, to goodness and things, and all wholesome things become fuzzy. And because it was unclear at the time of our Lord how leprosy was spread, all confirmed lepers, men, women, they lived in these perpetual quarantines, essentially, in self-isolation, gathering often in these above-ground sepulchres that the Jews had. There was one directly south of Jerusalem in the Hinnom Valley. They also had to wear special rags. Like, I know that guy, that girl is a leper because of what they're wearing and because they're shouting out in front of them, unclean, unclean. And if any of them came near to civilization deliberately and broke the rules, it wasn't going to prison. That wasn't their punishment, like we're so scared of, but it was being stoned to death. So we've got it pretty good. Where are the Romans? They were untouchable in a little bit of a different way. The rules for lepers, which I've summarized, they were mandated by God himself in the Old Testament, so in the inspired scriptures, especially the book of Leviticus. But many of the rules for interacting with non-Jewish people, like Romans, they were added on things by the Jewish rabbis. So for example, a Jew was not supposed to eat with a non-Jew, or enter under their roof, sound familiar in the gospel? Enter under my roof with them, receive hospitality. And you see this later during our Lord's Passion where the Jewish mob refused to pass the threshold of Pilate's, Pontius Pilate's area <coughs> with your Roman germs. So let's look briefly at both incidents, first the leper and then the centurion. Like so many things, our Lord, when he comes up against these rules and customs, more or less, crooked and misunderstood and prejudiced and things. He doesn't normally break them as such, but he, he transcends them and he sort of resurrects them. He had said it on one occasion, you've probably heard this before, I didn't come to destroy any of these rules, but I came to fulfill them. The leper first. He said, Lord, if you want to, you are able to cleanse me. Now, given what I've just said, if you've been listening, that's basically shorthand for, Lord, I know I am forbidden under pain of stoning to death from touching anyone. And I know that the person touched by me will have to quarantine and wash themselves endlessly. So, Lord, I do not call you rabbi because I know you are so much more than a rabbi. Lord, God, who have no need of words or touching to do anything. I ask that you cure me just by wanting it, just by willing it. And it's worth considering for a moment what would have happened, how different it would be if our Lord had fulfilled that request of the leper, the leper to the letter, that is with a, a touchless sort of cure or even a wordless cure, like just nothing, don't hear anything, don't see anything. Or for one thing, the healing of the leper could easily have been attributed to something else rather than our Lord, to someone else. Because you can be sure there were people standing around who do anything to deny some cause and effect link between this man and the people he was claiming to cure, a lot of Pharisees around, Pharisee-minded people. More importantly though, if our Lord had done a touch-free healing, that would have undercut his mission because a big part of his mission was to physically and intimately react and interact with his creation, especially weak things that we'd sort of push aside. So to restore it, to redeem it, to raise it to a divine level, sort of baptize everything, not just babies' heads, but everything. And so many of our Lord's cures were about touching. His greatest sacrament involves touching, getting inside of you so much. That's the, the most intimate touch, Eucharist. And by physically touching the leper, Instead of contracting disease and impurity himself, our Lord turns the whole process on its head. He becomes the one who transmits, who sort of infects the leper with perfect divine holiness and even physical health. He is not, our Lord is not the victim, he is the victor over the disease. 
And that's typical of Christ. He turns harmful things into beneficial things and forbidden things into admirable things. And that should be our life as well, to try and baptise and convert not only not just people, but anything we're involved in. And the servant of the Roman, just a brief word here. The, the leper couldn't, well, he could move, but he couldn't feel pain anyway. Whereas the servant could do neither, the paralytic servant. And as soon as our Lord is told of the paralysis, he offers to come and enter the house of the pagan Roman. His willingness to go and uh, do something which was poo-pooed by pretty much all the Jews, including the apostles around him. And he could have easily just have exhibited his divine power, cured him from a distance. Now he does end up doing that, but he doesn't show the intention of doing that. As I said, everyone around him thought that would be a terrible, breaking the rule, non-Jewish, ungodly thing to do. But he intended, he looked like he started walking towards the Roman house because our Lord, when it was a question of charity or showing love to someone, he did it regardless of how unpopular it made him. And just like with the leper, he actually shows his eagerness to go to this thing you shouldn't go to, this pagan house, to physically reach out with his divine body and touch this person or this forbidden thing. Of course, he doesn't go ultimately to the Roman's house. Why? Because he, saw, he foresaw something that was even greater than that, which is to manifest this faith of a total pagan. Not just say this centurion, this Roman centurion has showed great faith, but he showed greater faith than any of you other Jews around me. Imagine them hearing that, what an insult. What are some lessons I could take away from this whole thing? One is that I should strive to have at least the willingness to approach the untouchables in my life. Who are the untouchables? Lots of types of people, but whether they're untouchable because of some past disagreement I've had with them, or them with me, because they belong to a group which is considered to be competing with me, or because they have different religious affiliations or no religious affiliations at all. But if you're praying regularly and doing good reading, you'll know what, who, those, who those people are, all those things. Another lesson is, especially for parents, to ensure, especially for dads, it doesn't come so naturally to them, is to ensure that they're being affectionate with their kids, holding their hands, perhaps when walking, putting them on their knee or bouncing them up and down, kissing them, making little signs of the cross on their forehead at bedtime, putting your arm around them when you're reading to them. We know the children loved to come to our Lord, and when his apostles and things said, to get all these kids away from our Lord, he always told them off. He said, no, 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 no. Unless you become like this, you're not even entering the kingdom of heaven. And maybe the last thing, stretching it a bit, but let us regularly touch in the broader sense of approach and aggregate with our, our fellow Catholics, because we live in times uh, just the modern world, it's very easy to be alone, you know, pop the headphones on, things like that. To be an island, insulated away from people. And there is a time for that, of course. But if I find myself continually avoiding Catholics, fellow Catholics, whether because of I'm just naturally like that, I have a temperament which is more reserved, or because I have made a judgment, maybe a rash judgment, that others don't like me, or they have it in for me, or not in for me, in for me, or whatever. Uh, that's not right. That's, a, that's abnormal. And if you're trying to be perfect, bring it up in confession. Because when we converse and socialize with others, even when we don't like it, or especially when we don't like it, it's a great panacea for us, a universal medicine. It ticks a lot of boxes. It often reveals how wrong we were about what we were told about a person, because we come up against their reality. And it also provides an opportunity to correct any mistakes that they had about our words or our behavior, right? And it just forces us out of our comfort zone, which is always a good thing for being holy. And communion is not just something we do here with a capital C, but we need to commune with other people as far as we can, other human beings. So may, may each one of us reflect today, how can I better copy our Lord Jesus Christ with the untouchables in my life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.